Wild fermentations are used with cider, wine, and beer. But in this episode, of course, we are focusing on cider. And I have a recording on this topic from CiderCon 2022 titled Wild, Clean, and Free. Harnessing the Beauty of Wild Fermenting Without the Flaws. And that is our featured presentation on this year, episode 313 of Cider Chat. Hey, 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 my name is Rhea Wincaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. If you are new to Cider Chat, welcome aboard the Cider Train out into Ciderville worldwide. We have a ton of fun each week on this podcast, and there are over 300 episodes in the podcast archive page at ciderchat.com. So if that is your groove and you want to catch up with the world of cider, I do recommend checking that out. Or you could just follow along, subscribe, or hit the follow button wherever you are listening to this podcast right now. And to all the regular listeners out there, thank you for continuing to reach out, support this podcast, and check in. Let me know what's going on so I can share that to the rest of the world. Last week, I talked a little bit about David Timmerman. He wrote a beautiful letter to me all about support for Cider Chat and encouraging people to become patrons and his work, uh, a little unknown perhaps, at Abermile Cider Work. But he gave me a heads up that there was going to be a possibly good chance of Abermile Cider Works, which is based in Virginia, North Garden, Virginia to be exact, of potentially getting a pretty big award. And guess what? They did. They got the Governor's Cup Award. <laughs> for their 2019 Virginia Hughes Crab. And they also got two golds for their Wixen and Royal Pippin. And this is kind of huge because it's actually put on by the Virginia Wine Association. And to have a cider get best in show, well, look, hey, that's all about cider going up, baby. Yes, it is. And plus, not only do they make a good cider, they're they are outstanding people. And so, you know, I always love seeing Ann Shelton and, of course, Chuck Shelton, who is just amazing because at this Governor's Cup Award, he was wearing a suit. And for anyone in the cider world who has met Chuck or seen Chuck, even from the distance, you always see him in shorts, often with a little bag full of cider, which, you know, in my mind, that guy, he wins a prize for that every time. So I'm actually going to put a photo of Chuck Shelton in a business suit on the show notes for this year, episode 313, because it is, it's epic. It's really epic besides winning the awards. So kudos to everybody there. Check out Abermile Cider Works. I'm going to put links in the show notes. I have some episodes with Chuck and one with both Chuck and David Timmerman. Good people, really good people. And to all you out there, you know, Abermile Cider Works is one, but there's many cideries that are winning awards, getting back in that, that groove again, sending your your beloved product, you know, with a, a hope and a, a wink and a wish that it's going to get something. Kudos, you know, that, that takes a lot of bravery. I have in the past put my own homemade ciders in competitions, and sometimes it's really rough getting that that feedback, right? Or, you know, you spent some money putting an award, and you're like, why should I do that? But in the end, it's it's great for the cidery. You get feedback, and it's also great for the judges who learn how to up the ante and learn different ciders from different regions of the world. It's a win-win for all. So keep on stepping out into the world because the world is always asking us to participate, and this is one great way to do that, is to not be fearful of having your cider be judged. You know? I can't leave it there. I have a little bit more to say on this topic. Essentially, what is the final goal in the glass? And what I have been seeing more and more is that there's two different um, ends of the spectrum. Uh, This is what I want. I want a full mouthfeel. I want something that is savory, something that allows me to pause mid-conversation while I'm sipping your cider and say, hey, this is really good, isn't it? But doesn't make me pause and say, what's going on here? Uh, what am I detecting? Unless I'm judging that cider. That's one thing. But, you know, when I am 
drinking and it's casual and it's for enjoyment. I don't want to work hard. It's appearing to be two different camps. The one camp who makes cider that is just really smooth. I mean, it takes you by surprise. It kind of comes in the back door and says, hello, I'm here. Versus the one that kind of runs into the house and, you know, makes chaos everywhere. And you don't know where it's taking you. So that's what I've been experiencing. I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on this. What kind of cider you like? Because in the end, it's really about the greater population of consumers. Where do you want to take them? What is your end goal? I'd be curious to know. So send your send your thoughts to info at ciderchat.com. I only have so much time for cider in terms of what's in my glass because there's so many ciders for me to try. So I'm becoming increasingly more and more particular because uh, you have to when you are in the drinks trade. You have to. There's, you know, Believe me, you have to. And so therefore, I'm always looking for the glass that makes me go, ah, oh, this, is, this is great. It's complex. It's full. It allows me to pause. And if I want to take the time, I could go deeper. I'm not interested in that glass that's like, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> so there you have it. My two cents, and I'm sticking to it. Who wants a tan and bomb? I want a tan and bomb. Who wants to pull them down? I'm going to pull them down. Hey, hey, hey. Come and see. <laughs> and yet here I am singing a song with my cousin Jay about strange apples and tannin bombs. Uh, you know, high tannin in a glass. You know, it doesn't have to have high tannin to be good. It's all good as long as it is smooth and allows me to say, hmm. I like this glass. That's what it's all about. Hey, look, we have an amazing featured conversation, and it's a long one this week because it is a seminar, a recording from a seminar. So we're going to go to that next. This was moderated by Christine Walter of Balm and Cider. She is based out in Oregon, and she was... As always, it's just absolutely delightful. And I do have an episode, a standalone episode with Christine that I'll put a link in the show notes to. And then the three makers who are sharing their product is Levi Danielson of Raw Cider. And he is based in Oregon also, like Christine. And the cider that he had for this particular seminar is called Kush Wild Ferment. That's spelled K-O-O-S-H. And he'll be the first one speaking uh, after Christine. And then you're going to hear from Live Sonstrom, and he is based in Hudson Valley, New York. Another way people pronounce his name, because it's like a Swedish pron- pronunciation, is Leaf, but I believe the correct pronunciation is Live. And then if I do it a little bit in a Swedish style, it would be Sonstrom, or you could say Leaf Sonstrom, a very anglicized way to say it. Again, Hudson Valley Sonstrom Cider. And he poured a cider called Sponti from 2020. And then we had Soham Bot, who is based in my home state of Massachusetts. There are two locations for Artifact Cider, one in Cambridge and one in Florence. Florence is not currently open, but I'm sure it's going to be reopening soon. And his cider was a single varietal Roxbury Russet from 2017 Pet Knot. The way this presentation was set up is Christine was moderating it, and then we went through each of the ciders, and at the end there was a question and answer period. And you're going to hear something called YAN, spelled Y-A-N, and that stands for Yeast Assimilable Nitrogen. And it is something that can be measured in the making of cider. So yes, this is kind of a, a technical presentation this week on Cider Chat, but I found it really interesting because in essence, if you break it down, they're just talking about how do they make cider without the addition of a cultured yeast, like our friends at Fermentus make, right? They make cultured yeast. They're they're sponsors of this podcast. And of course, I use their yeast, right? Not only their sponsors, but sometimes I use cultured yeast. But I also do natural fermentations or wild ferments too. So I learned quite a bit here. And this is a real like hot topic, an exciting topic, because we know that there are ambient yeast out in nature already. Some are on apples, some are on pressing equipment. And it really will signify the terroir of that region because and 
a wild yeast from the hills of Montana or Wyoming, like our friend Ian McGregor and the folks at Farmstead Cider do. They, they do wild ferments also, so that's only a couple episodes back, is what these makers are talking about, where they are just letting the cider, the, the apple juice, when it was pressed, they don't add anything to it. Some may or may not do some sulfite addition. So that might be a little bit of sulfite in the beginning of the process here to ward off these like, you know, strains that aren't really strong of yeast. And if you don't know about cider, the thing about the conversion of the apple juice into cider where it ferments the sugar into alcohol, well, that is done by the yeast. They get to work and the yeast really impacts the final profile of that glass of cider. So it's pretty interesting to see, you know, having a cider from Oregon, from New York State, and from, in this case, these apples that Soham Bot at Artifact Cider Project was using were from just over the border in Massachusetts in Vermont. One thing I have learned with fermenting this way, doing a wild ferment, is that, yes, it could go in two different directions. (laughs) One is you could end up with this amazing product that needs a bit of aging. I find most of my wild ferments are best drunk two, three years down the line for them to settle into the bottle because it's like a live food, right? It's like almost like miso, if you know what I'm talking about. Or if you don't control the oxygen and the whole sanitation process, you could get acetobacteria, which gives it a really off flavor and it could kind of get that like kind of vinegary experience and that's nothing and nobody really wants that um, unless they are trying to manage a certain particular style and even then it's it doesn't want to go down that route of vinegar right we don't drink vinegar in large glasses so this is why it becomes a really hot topic how do you manage a wild ferment and keep it clean and natural and free of any faults and that's what they're talking about here Alrighty, so it's time once again to grab a glass and join this featured presentation on Wild, Clean, and Free, Harnessing the Beauty of Wild Fermenting Without the Flaws, as recorded at CiderCon 2022. I'm Christine Walter, and I am the owner, head cider maker at Bauman Cider in Jervis, Oregon. We are a farm-based cidery, and um, I've been making cider there for six years, and We don't do a lot of wild fermentation, so this was kind of a passion project of mine as I have been looking at doing more and more, and I have sought out like leadership within the within the cider community and and tasted a lot of wild ferments and found some of my favorite cider makers that are making those, and I could not be more excited to have you here to listen to what they have to say. Um, I want to give a little attention to the Cider Institute of North America, who I'm on the board of that group. We're doing great things for um, kind of building the industry through education, and Cena partners with the American American Cider Association to um, develop the cider making track for CiderCon. So, um, so thank you, thank you to all the work that the Cena members do um, to do that. And if you have any more questions, you can go on to ciderinstitute.com and look for classes, look for um, mission statement, that sort of thing. So, um, we are going to kind of go this. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, and then they'll do a quick little uh, description of what what the ciders in front of you are, one by one, and then we're going to kind of hit some questions that they'll they'll answer in different orders and that sort of thing. So it'll flow. It might get a little out of control. If you have questions that need to be answered right away, let me know, and we'll we'll see where they fit, and um, and we'll just see what all we can glean from these great minds of fermenters here. So um, I'm going to first introduce Levi Danielson of Raw Cider Company, and he'll give a little bit of his background and then tell you about his cider. Hi, everybody. I recently started my own cider company called Raw Cider Company, and I'm based out of McMinnville, Oregon. Um, Previously, I've worked for a few other cider companies before doing that. Uh, My background is microbiology and healthcare. In 2018, I made a plunge into doing cider professionally. 
um, and kind of launched that with a, a little tour in, in France. Um, I did some wolfing and um, had a home base on an organic orchard there and then toured around and met a lot of cider makers. And that's kind of my bend on the cider that I make um, is focused on traditional methods. I'm using English and French uh, bittersweet apples with a mix of uh, American varieties as well. Um, but really just trying to bring out the flavors from the orchard and um, translate the best way, um, those flavors the best into a bottle. Um, and what you have in front of you, so this is a, a grower in Amity, Oregon. I get my apples um, right now from family, from family farms and I'm working on planting my own orchard. Um, this particular one is biodynamic-ish. It's, uh, there's not really a name for, for what um, this grower is doing. Um, he's pretty innovative using compost teas and really trying to build um, the microflora and diversity in his orchard. And um, it's a blend of Harrison, Wixen, Gold Rush, and Redfield, and a little bit of Carmine. Um, and originally, he wanted to do a pitched yeast, but honestly, this was like the best orchard that I had access to, microbially speaking. And that's why I wanted to do a full-on wild ferment with this. This is a 2021 harvest, um, so it's a pretty quick turnaround, honestly. Um, it's a pet net. So I actually kind of pushed this one through production. Most of it isn't even bottled yet. Um, but this is what I wanted to highlight for this panel because it's a such a good wild ferment. My process basically is to use a, a small amount of sulfites in the beginning, and that's going to act on uh, weaker microbes, especially bacteria. And then um, it kind of lays the groundwork for the wild yeast to take over naturally. And those wild yeasts, I get a nice... Uh, slow fermentation, and the hope in that is to retain a lot of the aromas so they don't blow off in a hotter, uh, faster fermentation. Um, and as aromatically, this is one of the more aromatic ciders that, that I've produced, um, and in that regard, I'm, I'm happy with the result. I bottled it at a gravity of 0 0.005, and um, it fermented down to 0 0.03, so it could actually use a little bit more CO2 in there, but that's as far as it got before the presentation, so that's what you get. <clears throat> uh, it'll be a little bit more refined when I, when I release it into the public, um, but yeah. That's fantastic. That's it. Thanks, Levi. Yeah, you bet. Uh, Leif Sundstrom. Hi, I'm Leif Sundstrom. I have a Sundstrom cider in Hudson Valley, New York. Um, been operating for a little over eight years, kind of as an alt-prop gypsy of sorts as, as a producer. So I've been migrating around quite a bit and um, finding uh, native yeast cultivation at each different spot presents its own challenges and own interesting uh, results. So uh, learned a lot of lessons along the way because of that. So the cider that I brought to represent uh, Sunstrom cider today is Sponti. Uh, that's kind of uh, more or less the flagship, if you will, of kind of the basics that I usually do. There's a the varieties that I produce each year change. Sponti is kind of, to me, representative of uh, my own personal ideal of what Northeast cider means to me in a way. Um, and it's kind of representative of the base of what I tend to work with as far as fruit selection, focusing on native heritage heirloom apples that are primarily the ones that are native to the Northeast, but um, also uh, America at large. That doesn't mean other apples don't make their way in, as we'll see on the slide for Sponti. Um, but it kind of also represents kind of the general philosophy of my approach in a way too, which started with more interest in kind of finding terroirs, which has logistically proved a lot of difficulty at representing those particular, particular terroirs at scale in any way. But Sponti is more or less my New York blend, if you will. So this is, there's fruit sourced here from, in this particular vintage, it was just two orchards, but there's generally two to four that I work with between Finger Lakes and the Hudson Valley in New York. Um, Sponti is always native yeast, as Sponti implies. Sponti is just a term that I borrowed from the Germans. Um, prior to making cider, I kind of cut my teeth originally in agricultural alcohol in Oregon, working with wine, um, starting from a service perspective and then moving into working with sellers in uh, Carlton and in Willamette Valley. 
And from that kind of transition into a, a thirst to learn more about the various worlds of wine out there and stumbled into working for a national importer um, with a focus in my position on Germany, Austria, Grower Champagne. Um, and from there, I got to really m make a lot of connections with a lot of various producers and growers in different parts of the world. Um, and the idea of native yeast fermentation or sponti was not something that was so crazy or wild after a lot of those relationships were built because people had been doing such for such a long time um, in certain ways. And the term sponti came from the, the Germans, which is a very fascinating way they use the word to describe it as an adjective, a verb, and a noun um, in relationship to spontaneous fermentation. It could be an aroma, it could be a, a practice, it could be uh, a feeling you get after having something spontaneous. So that's kind of where that all comes from. The process at my, in Sunstrip Cider is largely focused on native yeast, but also heavily focused on maceration in the process and lees contact after fermentation. Sponti is kind of designed to be a little bit lighter than some of the other things um, that I make in that not everything sees maceration and the macerations that do occur are generally shorter than in other cuvées. Specifically, in this example, about a third of it or a little more was not macerated, the rest 12 to 18 hours. Um, Alternatively, with other uh, production, you'll see up to 48 or more hours of maceration prior to pressing. Um, and as far as the topic of process, uh, we can get into the nitty gritty, but you mentioned uh, talk about sulfur. Um, with Sponti, I will typically do a little kiss of sulfur at press, but not with anything else at this point. Um, everything else is successful native yeast fermentation without that. And the basis for the native yeast fermentation at Sunstream Cider is generated through the process of uh, a starter, or as the French call the pied de cuvée, um, a process by which I'm taking ideally lower pH selections of juice um, from the earlier pressings, uh, isolating them in smaller vessels. My vessel of choice is the nine gallon um, uh, demijohns. Um, and for me, it's just simply filling those up about two thirds and putting a reptilian terrarium heater underneath them for a little while. And you generally from 12 to 24 hours, those things are happily going. And um, I've just been very lucky. <laughs> the success of that has always been the way, but that's not to say every single Demijohn is used or even successful. So there's a whole host of glass used to kind of like isolate and find those things that will make a more successful fermentation down the road, which allows me to kind of, in some respects, I guess this could be debated, but um, get around doing the sulfur early on because the process now has moved into a little more cold settling, not cold crashing, but cold settling after press, just to kind of get a little bit more of the heavy sediment out of the way, then racking the juice and having a pita cuvee that's already healthy and combining them right away. In most cases, by the next morning, it's visibly active. So even in like a 2000 liter or larger tank. So that's kind of the basic nuts and bolts of the technicality. And I guess we're gonna to get to more of that stuff later, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. So Hambat. Hey guys. Um, so we're um, Artifact Cider Project in uh, in Massachusetts. Um, the the cider that you have today is a 2017 uh, Roxbury Russet that we made in a kind of you know rural method style, um, which is we just you know bottled it out of the tank essentially at around 1.4 bricks. Um, and this is from 2017, so it's, it's got some age on it. Um, what was interesting about that year for us was that we um, were, this was the second year we had been able to work with fruit of this uh, quality from a, a, an orchard called Scott Farm in Vermont. And um, they, I wanted to explore the various ways that you could uh, make a cider by, but by taking out a lot of variables. And so it was a single vari variety from one orchard, um, and we pressed enough to have one, you know, relatively large tank of it. And so we ended up making five different expressions from that single tank. Um, so what we did that year was um, the cider was fermented spontaneously. So for us, spontaneous, we don't do a little sulfur addition, but we will do a little nutrient addition um, to kind of get it get it kicked off. And I won't start temp, I'll, you know, I won't start any kind of temperature control until there's, um, you know, some evidence of of an active fermentation. But then we will uh, we will control temperature and manage it that way. Um, and then, so for this one, it was it kicked off. The tank had kicked off, and so uh, the first thing we did was when it got to around two percent bricks um, left, uh, we 
ran off a fraction of it, sterile filtered it, carbonated it, and put it in bottles. Then we, um, at the same, you know, uh, around the same time, because it would, you know, we had to kind of slow it down to get, uh, to kind of catch it at two. When it got to 1.4, we bottled off some of this as, as pet nat, um, and then we let it continue fermenting all the way dry, took a portion of that and inoculated it with yeast and added sugar to see what would happen if we did a kind of traditional method, um, you, know, you know, with plans to, to eventually disgorge it. Um, and then we bottled some of it still. <laughs> um, that's the, you know, what was, what was left. And then the very, very small amount was distilled into a small one gallon jug of brandy. Um, <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I wanted, the, the idea was to see if by removing a lot of different variables, um, but by honoring the, the, the fruit and it's the microbiology of the place and not really introducing too much intervention other than the interventions that I just explained, I wanted to see if there was, a, you know, an expression of this fruit that, wa that, was, that felt uh, truthful. Um, you know, and also was elegant. Uh, and so, you know, we ended up, uh, you know, over the years, uh, each one has evolved in its own way. I think this cider in particular, you know, was a little bit weird for, for, for a long time. And, and now it, it, it's really starting to kind of come into its own. I think all that extended uh, Lee's contact for all these years um, has really helped it develop a lot of interesting um, textural and flavor components. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, I think this is a really inter this was an interesting um, experiment for us. Over the years, you know, with art, with what we do with Artifact, and as we've grown, you know, I kind of started as a, you know, conventional uh, kind of cider, you know, following following the books, following the handbooks, methodology of production and, and making cider. And as the years have gone by, we've we've introduced spontaneous fermentation at larger and larger scales and in all different kinds of uh, packaging. Um, and so it's a bit, it's become a major cornerstone of what we do in our cellar. I mean, you know, even the stuff that we send into the broader market, um, you know, a, a good portion of that is spontaneously fermented by us in-house and in a, you know, relatively uh, clean way. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about this one. So. It's pretty uh. nice. <laughs> that is fabulous. I don't know about you guys, but I think all three of these are pretty amazing ciders, and I love the stories and how different they are, the process. And so as we think about wild fermentation and who makes the rules for that, uh, I, think, I think the agreement is that there really aren't a ton of rules beyond not pitching yeast, not pitching a commercial yeast, and so I want to discuss a little bit, like, what, is, what does wild mean, and, and are there rules to you? Uh, Leif, do you want to start with that? What was the first question? Uh, what does what mean? What is wild? Wild, right. Um, well, not to get into a deep lexicon talk, but, like, I, I, I opt not to use the word wild fermentation when explaining stuff to people. There's a few reasons for it, but primarily because I do the P de Cuvée process, as I mentioned. So to me, native yeast seems to be a little more appropriate and, um, and, and not, not for any other connotation with wild necessarily. But um, to me, that's kind of what it means, is using that which is available to me, um, not what I've provided. And I don't want to get too much into the why conversation, because I think that's coming up a little bit later. But um, as far as Rules, is that what the second part of the question yeah. was? What are the rules? I guess the rules are you don't pitch yeast. It's as simple as that. Like, and I think there's some great examples here of the variation and approach. You know, I'm a, I have a very small producer, um, and so certain elements of control using these nine gallon demijohns to get things started to kick off things that are not really much larger than 2,000 liter tanks is a lot different of a responsibility than say, but Soam has to take care of it artifact and their volume of production is much larger. So, you know, if I'm going to make any kind of rules for me, they're not going to apply to his situation. And so for the purposes of this conversation, I think that to me that's all the rules I'm interested in. Um, and I know people are coming in from a lot of different backgrounds. And I have my reasons for choosing to use native yeast, which are very different than these gentlemen. And I think we'll save that for later, right? But um, as far as rules go, I don't know. It's kind of a waste of time. <laughs> rules. <laughs> um. Yeah, sure. No, I, I, I pretty much entirely agree with uh, everything Life said. I think the only, the only rule that I, the, the only rule that I'll say is that, 
don't put shit in a bottle and call it wild just just to make it sound like something that you did um you know something cool that you did you know there's there's an important you know there's it's it's the post part and the and the discussion around it um so i think that just just be careful with that uh, <laughs> uh the last one or the best candidates I mean the last one. uh yeah, I mean, it's it's not the Wild West, per se, cowboy stuff. It's like there's a uh, a specific reason that we all um, use native ferments or wild yeast. Um, and it's uh, we're trying to amplify something special. It's not just lack of control. We're playing with uh, different tools than other cider makers might play with. Um, and it kind of leans a little bit more towards microbial warfare uh, rather than um, using more conventional tools like uh, using higher sulfite doses or something like that, um, for example. So. Or doing a, pit, a large pitch as well, which would just increase your, your yeast load and would wipe out a lot of the other microbes through competition. So. Thank you very much. Um, just one of you, when I hit uh, what you think are the best candidates for doing spontaneous ferment or the worst candidates? I'll roll right into that, too. I mean, I, I don't have, like, a, a hard band on. I don't think wild is always better. Um, I think there's specific scenarios where you can um, really, like, if you have good microbes, whether they're ones that, native ones that you've cultivated or ones that are cultivated in the orchard, and you can really get that expression from an orchard. If you have apples that are from um, Yakima that are intended for the grocery store, and they're harvested a little bit early with a really uh, intensive orcharding method, um, I don't see a large benefit in doing something wild with that because you don't have the microbial diversity that you would have from something that um, has a more diverse understory. That's my personal opinion, and that's uh, how I would approach uh, that. Also, just to add to that, with the grocery store apples, is um, uh, st store long, long cold storage um, for for yes. for those. You can you can you can you can spontaneously ferment like you know conventionally grown apples, but um, you you if you wait really really long and you you know you press juice or something and you know like May with with cold stored apples. The, um, the population of lactic acid bacteria increases significantly and can really affect uh, the performance of that wild fermentation um, or that spontaneous fermentation. So, And a lot of these microbes are fragile. It's like they exist in the orchard at certain temperatures at certain times. And as soon as you start crushing, um, uh, breaking your apples down and turning them into juice and changing the temperature, like that the microbes in that fermentation are changing at the same time. So if you do have a long delay between your harvest and um, your actual fermentation and it's unintentional, um, you're going to get a different fermentation than if you were to do it fresh. A lot of these microbes are, are pretty fragile. Even in fermentation, a lot of apiculate yeasts will taper out at even 1% or 2% alcohol. And um, I think that maybe they contribute a lot towards the flavor profile. Let's say you begin a wild fermentation, strumming along, and then you start to notice something wrong. Some off smells, off flavors, you're seeing some things. What are your tools? What's in the toolbox? Uh, any of us? Okay. Um, I'll, I'm going to borrow from Amy at yesterday's crab seminar. I'm, to answer this question, curious, how many people in the room are active producers of cider? Okay. And how many of those people are actively utilizing native yeast fermentations? In the, so the majority, it seems like, at this point. And um, Christine, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, if something starts to go wrong in your fermentation, what are the tools you use? Yeah, so I just got, I guess I asked that to understand the relationship people might have to this because um, for me, it's primarily just sensuous, you know, analysis. It's the nose, first and foremost, and then secondarily flavor. That's how I would observe something. But the question of what I would do if I observed a flaw it really depends on a whole host of matrices of things, yeah? So first of all, what is it I'm smelling that's off? Is it some kind of reductive situation? Is it a VA situation, et cetera, et cetera? Um, 
So there's really no one short answer, but for me in my process, my, my basic tools is oxygen is a, is a really useful tool because I find with native yeast fermentation, um, a little bit more likely to see reduction become an issue during the fermentation process. Um, that all depends a lot on your apples as well as where they were grown, et cetera. Um, but I like working with Northern Spy and damn if it doesn't matter what orchard or what year, it always shows reduction during ferment. And so oxygen becomes a tool if I can be observ observational enough at the right time to be able to do a racking or an aeration when the reduction starts to show itself. Now that works for my particular ap appreciation of the fermentation results. Someone that may want a more kind of, you know, primary fruit, more fresh example of things might be a little weary of doing that aeration process um, for another host of reasons. So the, the responsive tools are really dependent upon your starting point, your objective ending point, and the actual activity that's happening as it's happening, as far as, as my opinion. I mean, I don't take prophylactic measures so often, um, and if I do, they are very gentle prophylactic measures. So for me, when it comes to responding to a cider and reacting to uh, potential flaws, response and reaction are like the two key words there for me. So what drives me to really be interested in the native yeast fermentation is the very basic fact that it requires me to have a more engaged relationship with the process as it's happening. Um, it, it, it's really a personal thing for me. It's not a dogma or a flag I wanna wave to be an evangelist about. Um, I think at one time I might have done that, but over the years, especially as I've continued to do this process, learn more about myself in the process, the more engaged I am in those relationships. So responsiveness and reaction is really, is, I guess, without saying oxygen or sulfur or any of the other things, those are the two real best tools um, to being aware and present. And that's, that's the challenging part for me in my process. Yeah, I mean, I would uh, just add by saying that, you know, um, what do you do uh, when something goes wrong is don't be negligent in the first place. Um, you know, I think paying attention, being active, being present with what you're, what you're doing um, is probably the most important thing you can do to prevent uh, those things from happening in the first place, especially things like mold. You should never, you know, mold is, mold is just negligence. Um, but one thing, that I, one thing that I'll add is that, you know, if you're interested in, uh, in this process and you guys are it looks like a bunch of you are already doing it so you have experience but start small and practice you know um, practice with all things and knowledge you have to kind of everybody is in a different place using different you know using different fruit different um, climate different you know different technology different tools start small try a bunch of stuff um, and see what you can learn from it and try and identify if things did go wrong, if you can try and identify how or why. Um, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of things you can just Google. Uh, you know, hey, this happened. Uh, in, and you can use wine, you can try and search it for wine, and that might give you an idea of like, oh, okay, that's a flaw that's caused by this. And, it, and it, as you learn, uh, as, as, as any of us do with, with, with uh, uh, being professional fermenters, you just kind of figure, it, you figure out how to do it. Um, you know, that's, that's the best advice that I can give anybody. Uh, you know, I, you, can't, you can't be that prescriptive because each situation is a little bit different. And I think the uh, important piece right there too that you're um, talking towards is to, it's to pay attention. It's not an art of neglect or anything like that. Um, and if things do start going out of the realm of what you want, you can kind of coax them back uh, before you lose a batch or something. Because when you start playing around with like the frontier of fermentation and experimenting, um, and if you're not paying attention, it can very much like go sour uh, pretty quick. And I don't mean like literally sour. I'm just like, <laughs> well, it could. I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> both. You know. Uh, so um, just so, try to stay within those um, boundaries, the bumpers. So. Uh, my mom said something to me when I was younger, nothing to do with fermentation, but it <laughs> goes into the kind of the ends of what these guys were saying. I always remember when thinking of approaching this and she says, don't use Taoism as an excuse for laziness. <laughs> and she didn't even know what Taoism was. She just thought that I was <laughs> goofing off. But at the same time, I think that's kind of resonates with the approach to kind of native yeast fermentation or wild or natural production of things is that, you know, we could say we're doing by not doing, but 
even that mind has to be a present mind. Yeah, so that's the important part there. Yes. So the question is, um, uh, which, which specific apples or types of apples, classes of apples, are the best? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. For me, I, I think, you know, you c it can be done with just about anything, right? But uh, I think what provides a, a, an environment for a healthier native yeast fermentation is lower pH and higher bricks. Um, in, in general, tannic apples can have their own uh, assistance with the tannins as well in certain capacity, but it all depends on maybe how it's blended. But the basic nuts and bolts for me is bricks and pH. I'm not selecting specifically to get that so that the fermentation is what it is. It tends to be that then apples, varieties that are native to the Northeast that I like to work with often have uh, lower pH and, and in some cases very high bricks, um, even outside of the crab realm, like golden russet in the Hudson Valley, sometimes we can see potential alcohol of over 10%. Um, and what I mean by uh, higher bricks is not necessarily because it's, you know, going to be, and sometimes people look at that as a better quality body cider, but really what it is is you have a good source material for the Saccharomyces to really kind of create a healthier, more rolling uh, fermentation as opposed to something that might it's just less stressful factors. And the low pH element is specific to kind of inhibiting some of the more lazy bacterium and things like that. And it, there's an inherent stability uh, right. that comes yep. with, 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 with something that has higher alcohol and lower, you know, and lower pH, um, especially when you're doing something like, you know, a, a pet nat style where you're, you're kind of giving away some control at the end. Um, that, 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 those parameters can really help with a situation like that. There's also a few different games, too, within wild fermentations, depending on pH. Um, and if you're going to do something that's like pet nat, keeving, successive racking, um, and then pH-dependent uh, microbes, too. So as you get lower on the pH scale, you're um, working with different threats than you are higher on the pH scale. Um, and that's something that you take into consideration, or I take into consideration as well. So, Thank you. Uh, thanks for that question. So a couple of you, at least, do both pitched yeast fermentations and wild. And I know that that's always a big concern if you've got a, you know, a, a clean facility or a, a, a facility with um, controlled yeast populations. How do you deal with fermenting in the same space with wild? Are you worried? Uh, I've been told to be worried about that. Um, <laughs> But honestly, um, in, are we talking about like a, a house strain that exists in, um, in our cidery, for example? So I've done a lot of really slow and low wild ferments in an environment that also have a lot of pitched yeasts. And I still, um, some of the, the house yeasts that might be existing in there might come off, um, come into my batches and finish them off. Although the way that that works out, I don't really know if that's the case because my fermentation speeds stay low and slow and I still get um, fermentations that will end when I want them to end with successive racking, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of suggests that I'm not getting an aggressive house yeast getting in there and finishing it completely dry. And these are in the same uh, building, same environment, same equipment. So I don't, I don't keep them separate. Great. Um, so do you have anything? Um, yeah, so uh, we have a different, we have all different sorts of uh, um, kind of approaches to this. Um, you know, the main thing is that we don't press our apples in our facility. Um, and so depending on, there are certain, certain places that uh, I've had consistently more successful um, native fermentations from, certain, certain, you know, certain pressing houses, for example, um, you know, where they're, and, and those places don't have any exposure to wine yeast or anything like that. Um, they, they, you know, and, and so the majority of it's really coming from the apples, from inside the apple, from the outside of the apple, the bins and all that stuff that's in the orchard, the the pressing equipment that some of these orchards use is is old, um, it's wooden, um, you know, and those those tend for me at least to be to I tend to find the healthiest um, spontaneous ferments coming from places like that versus like a sterile 
you know, giant, like room sized press situation. Um, you know, and so when we, if we're looking to do a kind of, um, you know, spontaneous or even a, 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 a kind of st style like that, um, we've isolated some of those yeast cultures from different orchards. Um, so one of the things that we did that was, that was, uh, was an interesting project from like a couple of years ago was um, we, certain, you know, we had like some totes that were, had been used successively from the same place over and over again. So we knew that they were dirty. You can't, you can never really clean a tote. Um, and we had, you know, uh, juice that we trusted was going to be, you know, it was going to be successful, like low pH, high, high sugar. And, um, let those, let those ciders, you know, ferment out. And then, but we took a portion of it and kind of like what, um, Leif does is, kind of built starters for each of those separate places, made, made sure we were very, you know, particular about keeping them separate. And we sent them out to get it analyzed. Um, and so they were sequenced and uh, it was also tested, a viability was tested against uh, uh, grape juice, apple juice, um, brewer, uh, like uh, brewers, uh, what wart. is it called? Malt. Uh, wart. Wart, yeah, wart. Um, and, uh, and so we, we tried it, we, what was really cool was that it, was the most successful in the apple juice medium, so that was really fucking cool. Um, and then, so all of them. So we took that we took that culture and then banked it away. And so we have the we have access to these cultures, and we know that they're 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 of different. We know that they're different from each other. We know that they have different types of bacteria and different types of Britannomyces and different types of Saccharomyces in them which was also really fantastic um, to see those differences and to learn about them a little bit. Um, you know, I didn't go like really, really far, like, you know, I don't know, I'm not like naming the specific, you know, whatever it is, we just have it, we, it's just a mixed culture from a place that we keep. We, I, I make no claims on its consistency, um, but we do use it, uh, you know, we, we will pull those from time to time if we're using a, you know, if we're working with a juice that might be suspect to, you know, doing a spontaneous, true spontaneous um, fermentation. And so, and then with, 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 you know, with pitched, with pitched stuff, we generally just keep it to um, stainless steel um, tanks where we can kind of ensure, uh, you know, we're using equipment and all the stuff that is used for those processes so that it stays in one kind of zone um, in one, one place, you know. Um, you know, we don't pay that much attention to things like gaskets or whatever because most of the uh, well, most of the pitched uh, cultures that we do, we, we're, we are using like killer strains, and so I assume that for the most part that takes care of it. Um, and then and those are relatively quick as well, so we stabilize them and things like that. So it's uh, it's yeah, it's 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 just a matter of kind of how you making those decisions that come with some experience, and then also for us learning about each of these different places and the cultures that are there. And then having them at our, you know, at our disposal if we do ever need them to use as we would a commercial yeast. That's great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, one more question before I open it up to questions, and that is, uh, briefly, would you describe your dream fermentation? Like, tell me the apples. Tell me your process. Tell me how you're finishing it. What's it look like? Uh, I would have. 50 year old standard trees with uh, <laughs> some cows or pigs or sheep uh, foraging underneath them, controlling the understory. Uh, they would be picked perfectly ripe. I'd probably have to climb the tree and shake it. Uh, I wouldn't have the animals in there anywhere near then. You know, they'd be like poop free. Although it would still be sterile because the fermentation process takes care of that. The French and the English and the Spanish will tell you that. Um, and. Yeah, I don't know. I would just have like a good mix of tannin, acid, and um, body in my cider and just play with those different parameters, doing keeving and successive racking and getting some residual sweetness through interesting methods and see what happens. Uh, trying to, to keep it clean through natural processes, I guess. Awesome. I'd probably get a food or two. Oh. A big one. <laughs> a big one. <laughs> Love it. Leif? I, I don't know. I don't really th guess I think about things quite in that way. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get an answer, but I don't know what the perfect uh, dream thing is. It's uh, one, one that is successful enough to allow me to try again next year. That's pretty much, <laughs> to me, that is kind of 
Okay. All I can ask for at this point. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in the same boat. Yeah. I'm in the same boat as that. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because I, I think about fifth. this process too and like utilizing these elements that I said before pull me into the present moment of the actual act. And when you think about it, how many times in our lives do we actually get a try doing this? You know, it's like you could start making cider portrait based cider specifically I have to articulate here but you can start doing that when you're 18 maybe retire when you're 80 that's not a whole lot of times you get to try doing this stuff right and so for me in the beginning there was a lot of like paranoia and nervousness about how do we do this perfectly right how do I get it right so that it, I can I don't want to waste time I've only got maybe 50 tries at this you know and then over time it's become like a little bit more of I think I'm just gonna be okay with things being not perfect anymore. You know, and that's been part of the process. So for a perfect fermentation for me would be to have gotten to the point where that hope of the process for me is actual reality and I'm not freaking out and anxious the entire time things are going on. <laughs> I love it, thank you. All right, let's uh, open to some questions. Let's start over here. Rick. Did you guys, did you guys uh, ever test again yeah, and did you get the point? Mm. I don't, but I want to and it's extremely important. Um, and I think that, well, I mean, it's extremely important for uh, fermentation speed and if I'm doing something like keeving or successive racking, for example. I've done a bunch of that uh, yan stuff. Um, I mean, well, well, the main thing for, for us with, uh, with the orchards that we work with, for the most part, every single year I'm surprised by how low the yan is um, when it's coming in. I, I, don't, I haven't really had that much juice that comes in with a good amount of it ever. Um, and so we measure it just with a formal titration. Um, and... Every, every time it's always low. Um, and so we don't really do Kiev. I, I, I don't really mess around with that style like what Levi does. Um, ours is a lot more of a kind of controlled, healthy, relatively slow, but not really super slow, you know, relatively cold, not crazy cold um, fermentation. And those, um, you know, for those we do, we, we will do nutrient. Um, and I'll bring it, you know, Depending on what it is and how much I care about what, where it might end up, um, you know, it might, I might even bring it all the way to, you know, I might bring it to 150 ppm to start, um, and you know, and, and then really keep the temperature on the low side. Um, I think that's a good. If you really want something like, hey, I don't want to lose any sleep over this, and I, I don't know if, it, you know, I really want this to be healthy and, and get going, uh, I think that's like a that's like a, a healthy amount. Um, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't really go more, too much more higher than that, um, you know. So keeping it somewhere in that range, 150 is a good kind of this way or that way. Go a little lower, go a little higher. I would never really go above 200 to start. That's great. Thanks for the question, Rick. For anybody who didn't know, um, that's yeast assimilable nitrogen levels that he was asking about. How about here? Do you find that you have an ideal temperature range when you're fermenting, mm. or does it vary based? This question is about variable temperatures during fermentation, and you're going to hear from Leaf first. Is that implying that the temperature is being controlled in the process? Okay, yeah. For me, I, I don't do, I mentioned cold settling before, um, but there's no temperature control during the actual fermentation process. Um, I try to keep ambient temperatures at 60 or just below, you know, and um, over the years, it's, it seemed to be that the, the typical range that ends up happening almost every year for the peak of fermentation stays within the low 60s to, and maybe peaks at around 66, 68 typically. So an ideal situation is kind of that for me and I've kind of, it just, luckily that happens and kind of dovetailing into the yan question, I probably should be measuring and I'm probably dealing with a lot of low nitrogen, or low yan and that's probably why those, maybe those temperatures are staying a little low and the fermentations are going a little slow. Um, but I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't change that if the yan was low so I don't bother to measure. But um, so that's for me, it kind of works out. But there are years when certain yeasts, especially using these pita cuvées, sometimes after a couple batches in a row of it getting cycled or whatever, they'll, they'll wake up and surprise you and they'll just take off, you know, and they'll do something really hot. But even then, peak temperatures tend to kind of clip out at around 70-ish, so. It's uh, incredibly important, um, and I, I do um, ambient temperature fermentations, and I've done fermentations um, in Vashon, Washington, and then also McMinnville, mm -hmm. which aren't that far apart, really, um, but the difference between uh, the results in wild fermentations are, are pretty big, so the apples are harvested earlier in McMinnville than they are in Vashon, 
in addition to the temperature variance from the, from the different latitudes. Um, so going down to McMinnville, um, it's four hours south. Um, I have to play a different game with my fermentations because I'm fermenting, uh, pressing juice at warmer temperatures, and I actually have to slow those fermentations down a little bit more than I did when I was in um, Washington. Um, so, but I also don't implement any temperature control actively. I just kind of work with the ambient temperature and adapt to what I need to be doing um, accordingly. It also is a decision on when I do a wild ferment, because if it's early apples, I won't do a wild ferment with those, um, just because the, it's gonna proceed pretty fast anyway and be warmer, and I've found that um, I don't get the, the same yeast populations with warmer fermentations as I do cold fermentations. That's um, very true too. Yeah, so we, we, do, we do some controlled. Um, so we do some uncontrolled, some free rise, like what life, you know, just, I call it free rise when it's just like, let it go. Um, at some that we will implement control at specific points, um, you know, it, it really just depends. It depends, I think at least it's, it's a lot about outcomes. Um, you know, we're not making the same spontaneous fermented cider, you know, like every, every single year, like on a yearly basis, we're, we're trying all different kinds of things every year. Um, you know, and so for some of those, it's, it's totes and sitting in our cellar and some are in little, little stainless tanks that have control that we're, we're doing things to. It, it just depends on, depends on what we're looking for, for those. Yeah. Dave? Are you doing any fermentation in barrel and trying to keep the that way? The question is, uh, are they doing any fermentations in barrels? My production process is kind of like... I have done fermentations in barrels, but um, I kind of prefer the stainless steel primary. Um, I, I age plenty of ciders in barrel, and typically when I rack to barrel, I, I rack early. Um, I like to take some lees and suspension into the barrel with me. Um, so some element of fermentation is occurring in that barrel, but as far as the primary, no. I, I think it would be a lot easier to do a wild fermentation in barrel. Um, I've, I've done it with grapes in the past at the wineries I worked at, but not with cider so, so much. But you do, yes? No, I'm, I'm barrel curious, though. And I've got, <laughs> I've got some winemaker friends that I uh, think we're going to do a little collab on, and I'm, I'm excited and nervous about it. Uh, but there's a lot of cool um, oxidative kind of uh, things that can happen in a barrel primary. Um, and a lot of things that can also go bad, but um, that's also why it's interesting. For a small urban winery, we don't control any of our orchards, so we work with a number of small producers. Do you have criteria or expectations or quality control from, I would say, from pick to press in order to do a wild ferment? Well, I, I will say, like, I also kind of, I, I work with other growers that I don't always have, con I mean, I have relationships, but certainly not control. And the discussion of the microbial influence from the orchard into the cellar, I, I'm a little dubious of, to be quite honest. Like, I know it has some impact, but so far as the ultimate final success of everything, I don't know. There's a lot of other factors that are inter intermediate, uh, intermediate there. So for me, to answer your question, what I do when I'm getting that stuff to into my facility or whatever, Everything from there and on is about sanitation of my own process and my own work and my own space. So that, to me, kind of protects everything in the best way it can. But as far as like working to get more microbial stuff into the apples that I bring in, I don't have the control to do that. But um, I've yet to have a stuck fermentation or anything like that without that kind of control. Um, and again, I do a pied de cuvee process, which is likely to be having a slightly more influence from the cellar space itself, just because of the time that, that that process adds to maybe that, unless you're doing a total cool ship or open whatever. But um, so I may just be having different things that are helping me in, at the play there. But um, you guys are a little bit more. Are you What's that? Acetobacter, prominent, which is it's okay, but it's almost too much, and I just so is it on the. I think we're doing everything right. Of course, I think we're doing everything right. Um, but is there is there something that I have to ask the growers and the press to be doing? Uh, I wouldn't think very so. Very much. I don't know. Well, potentially. Yeah. Um, and I think that Acetobacter might be more a result of um, infection after pressing more so right. than in the orchard, for example. Yeah. So 
uh, some main factors that you'd want to look at is uh, your oxygen exposure, your temperature, um, and uh, also they're they're pretty sensitive to sulfites too at, at pretty low doses. Um, so those are some things that you could. Yeah, and then it's a, as far as like talking to orchards and things like that too. If you want to get them kind of changing their process, that might be more um, something that you'd be interested in. You can get them excited about uh, wild fermentations and kind of suggest cool things that they could do to get you better products. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. That was a really great workshop, and I wish you could have been sitting next to me as we were sipping those ciders from these amazing producers. Once again, we want to thank Christine Walter of Baum and Cider, Levi Danielson of Raw Cider, Leib Sundstrom of Sundstrom Cider, and Soham Bhatt of the Artifact Cider Project. There was a little bit more questions at the end. They got super nerdy, so I'm going to be sending them to the patrons of this year's podcast, where you too can become a patron by visiting Cider Chat Patreon page, which is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And with that, I'm going to leave you here. This is Rio Windcaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. We like cider. We like palms. Of orchards and having fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. We. We like cider, we like palms, we like orchards, having some fun. There is a reason, there is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet, oh yeah. We, we like cider. Oh yes we do. We like palms. Oh yes we do. We love orchards, having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. There's a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We like cider. We we like palms. Oh yes, we do. We like orchards, having some fun. Yeehaw!